Today, we're going to talk about implementing soft processor cores inside an FPGA. The idea of implementing soft processor cores in programmable logic devices has become quite familiar for many hardware and software engineers. For many years, we have all enjoyed the luxury of larger FPGAs that have more than enough space to integrate a soft processor core inside the device. So, first of all, what do we mean by a soft processor core? To state it simply, it's when we take the logic of the microprocessor and we build it out of the flip-flops, lookup tables, multipliers, and all of the other architectural features that we find inside modern FPGAs. This is a different idea to the fixed functionality of a processor that has been created as a dedicated chip and has then been purchased and soldered down to the board. The soft processor exists as part of the FPGA's programming bitstream and so is only alive when the FPGA has been configured after power-up. One example of this that you may have seen is to use a ready-built IP core, such as the Microblaze 32-bit processor that is provided by Xilinx, who incidentally are the sponsors of our webinar today. The result of integrating a processor core as a soft implementation inside the FPGA is that it becomes tightly integrated with the rest of the logic in the FPGA. An FPGA design will naturally contain other custom logic, and therefore the processor IP becomes tightly integrated simply because it is sitting right next to that custom logic inside of the device. However, before we get too deeply into that, and by way of contrast, we should briefly discuss the alternative way that it can be done, and indeed the way that lots of engineers have done it for many years. For longer than anyone can probably remember, engineers have been choosing a processor or a microcontroller and placing it on the PCB next to the FPGA. PCB traces are then routed between the two devices, and that forms the communication between the hardware and the software in the designed product. So what we're talking about is a two-chip design on the PCB. One of the chips is a processor and it runs software, and the other, which is an FPGA, and that contains custom programmable logic. This method of doing things is very popular and very common, but it also has limitations. And to identify those, we should first examine how the two devices would work from the system designer's perspective. The system designer is responsible for identifying how the different requirements of the overall system are going to be implemented. Some tasks lend themselves naturally towards being implemented in software, and other tasks are better suited to the programmable FPGA hardware. As a result, the system designer will identify the various processing tasks within the overall product specification and choose whether to implement those tasks either inside the FPGA or inside the processor. Given that the software and hardware in the system usually communicate with each other in some way, then an important system-level decision has also got to be made at this stage. How will the communication between the chips be implemented? Will it be a simple point-to-point -point connection with very low bandwidth that perhaps could be fulfilled by using a serial port or a UART? Or does the interface need to be much higher bandwidth and therefore require some sort of parallel data interface or perhaps even a high-speed serial transceiver? It could be that the communications will be multi-drop in nature, allowing many chips to talk to each other, perhaps requiring the use of something like I2C or SPI. These are important decisions because it instantly locks the design of the PCB down due to the interface that must be implemented between the devices on the board. The PCB traces represent the maximum possible bandwidth of the communications between the hardware and software domains, and you can only significantly change that bandwidth by re-spinning the PCB. Therefore, this is a very important decision, because re-spinning the PCB is a very costly and disruptive thing to do later in the design. As well as the considerations relating to the data bandwidth, we also have to consider that the two devices will also consume system resources in various different forms. The first consideration is perhaps I.O. count, because a set number of pins on both the processor and the FPGA must be set aside for the purpose of implementing that interface. The number of required IOs on both the processor and on the FPGA will impact the choice of those components, and therefore that usually has an impact on the cost of those components. PCB space is required to implement any communications interface, and it is also very common for communications interfaces to require additional components in the form of termination resistors, pull-up resistors, or even logic level converters in some cases. These factors all add to the cost of the overall bill of materials, and also to the cost of the PCB design itself due to potential increased complexity. The next impact to implementing chip-to-chip -chip interfaces is power. IOs are power-hungry, 
and therefore the overall power consumption of the system will rise by implementing any communications interface between two devices. If the interface is very fast, then the designer may also need to consider signal integrity issues, which opens up a whole different can of worms for any design. The annoying reality is that any communications interface implemented on a PCB can potentially cause a knock-on effect for other parts of the design, which could be awkward and costly to change later if it ever becomes necessary. It's therefore generally better and easier to keep data inside of a single chip for as long as you possibly can, because the moment it has to leave that chip, you will have other engineering challenges to think about. So, by putting the processor inside the FPGA in the form of a soft IP, a considerable quantity of these problems can be eliminated. When you do that, the interface between the hardware and software domains inside the design is all done using internal FPGA routing, meaning that it can be changed at any time in the future. The connections within an FPGA are determined by the bitstream, which is the programming file that is ingested by the FPGA device when power is applied. As such, the bitstream is a soft aspect of the design, which doesn't generally have any impact on the cost of the overall system, and can be easily changed whenever you want to. The power requirements of putting a processor inside the FPGA are lower, because there are no IOs involved. The bandwidth of the communications channel can be configured and reconfigured as many times as you wish, to take on whatever form is required, all at no additional cost. The biggest benefit, however, is achieved by the nature of the communications channel between the processor and the FPGA logic. Whereas with separate devices, we had to choose between established communication protocols that were designed specifically for IOs, when we have everything inside the device, we can take advantage of a much higher bandwidth interconnect. Custom programmable logic can be connected directly to the processor buses, and this reduces latency, increases bandwidth, and generally makes for a more integrated system. You'll be able to transfer data between different parts of a chip far faster than you can ever transfer data between two chips. So as we briefly mentioned earlier, for many years Xilinx have been offering the Microblaze soft processor IP. It was first introduced back in the era when PowerPC processors were being offered in the Vertex 2 Pro family of FPGAs. If you can remember back that far, the bus standard that was adopted for Microblaze was initially something called the On-Chip Peripheral Bus, or OPB, because this was one of the buses that was used with the PowerPC architecture processors. Later on, it was then updated to use the Higher Performance Processor Local Bus, or PLB. As the years went on, the use of PowerPC processors became less popular, and they were replaced with ARM architecture processor cores in many designs. Microblaze evolved accordingly and the internal bus protocols were updated to use ARM's Advanced Microcontroller Bus Architecture, or AMBA. Specifically, the interconnect that was used in the later years of the Microblaze design was something called the Advanced Extensible Interface, AXI, or sometimes known as AXI. Xilinx have spent many years building up a wide range of available IP that uses the AXI interconnect, allowing the soft microbrace processor, and obviously also the hardened ARM processor cores that are found in the more recent system-on-chip devices, to be quickly and easily connected to a huge range of processor peripherals that meet the needs of many markets. Microblaze has arguably been a very successful product, principally because it was designed to efficiently use the logic blocks that are present in Xilinx FPGAs. However, as time progressed, FPGA devices have become larger and larger, and therefore the percentage of the device that's needed to implement a soft processor core, which was previously considered to be a fairly large block of IP, has become less and less significant. In fact, FPGAs are now so large that the size of a design is sometimes not considered to be quite as important to designers. In fact, one of the key goals of modern FPGA designs is a focus on ease of integration and rapid development of the design, with a goal of allowing engineers to bring their products to market in the fastest possible times. As soon as ease of integration becomes the major driving force, then designers and engineers will naturally gravitate to the most popular and well-supported solutions, in order to benefit from the broadest selection of ready-made IP and an abundance of third-party design assistance that is generally available. So if we're talking about soft processor cores that are well-supported solutions, at this point we need to welcome to the stage a selection of ARM soft processor IPs, namely the Cortex-M1 and Cortex-M3 CPUs. ARM has recently made some changes to the way that their soft processor IPs are offered, 
by wrapping up those IPs in a file format that is natively understood by the Xilinx development tools. This has been done to enable engineers to integrate the soft processor IPs into an FPGA design with minimal fuss. Engineers who are interested in this solution can visit the ARM website and download from a choice of two bundles that offer solutions for either the Cortex-M3 or the Cortex-M1 soft CPUs. These file bundles include a reference design and also a series of control files that, as we'll see shortly, make the Cortex processor IPs appear as tiles in the Xilinx Vivado block diagram editor. Given that it's a soft core, the IP from ARM is synthesizable, making it very flexible for engineers to include it in their FPGA designs. And even though the IP is encrypted, it includes a number of parameterizable options that allow the designer to select precisely what they need for their design. Due to the way that the IP has been integrated into the Xilinx toolflow, we can very quickly explore those different parameters in the Xilinx Vivado tools and see what's available. The demonstration that I'll show you here is going to use the Cortex M3 core, but the same process applies. block diagram as part of the design. So to see that in action, let's create a new project. And I'll choose a well-supported development board as the target for the design. Don't worry about the details of this board at the moment, because we'll come back to that a bit later. With the project created, I can create a blank block diagram. And as you can see, the GUI is guiding me to click the Add button to add my first IP to the design. From the list, I can now browse or search for the Cortex M3 IP from the IP catalog. Adding the IP to my design is as simple as clicking and dragging it into the block diagram. And as you can now see, there are a number of connections on the IP that appear by default, some of which are clocks and resets, some of which are debug signals, and others represent interfaces that allow many signals to be connected using just one net on the block diagram. We'll come back to the various connections in a short while, but first let's explore the configurability of this IP a little further. I can edit the configurable parameters on the IP by double-clicking on the tile. And as you can see, there are now a number of different tabs that give me access to the general configuration parameters, the debug features, the tightly coupled instruction memories, and the tightly coupled data memories. If you attended our previous webinar on the Cortex-M class of processors, you may recognize some of these features. Starting on the first tab, which is for general configuration, we can see that the first configuration parameter is automatically calculated, and it reflects the number of interrupts that are configured on the processor. This value will be automatically updated depending on how many interrupt lines are connected to the IP in the block diagram. The next option is the width of the signal that stores the priority level for each interrupt signal. Interrupt priority levels on the Cortex-M series of cores can have up to 256 levels, which would require an 8-bit signal to store each value. However, many processor systems simply won't need that many levels of interrupt priority and therefore an optimization of the IP can be made to reduce the size of the logic. Here we can see that the priority level of the interrupt can be reduced to just eight different levels, obviously requiring just three bits of storage per value. So when you have a processor core that can have up to 240 connected interrupt lines, this apparently small saving can actually have a significant impact on the size of the logic in the FPGA that's required. The next two parameterizable options on the Cortex-M3 relate to the inclusion of a memory protection unit, which can be included or excluded as a synthesizable option to save space in the FPGA. There is also the option of implementing a wake-up interrupt controller, giving the system the ability to wake the processor from a deep sleep when an interrupt is raised. The last option here is the support for something called bit banding. In many processor cores, 
Configuration registers on the peripherals will use a single bit of a 32-bit register to represent a feature that can be switched on or off. If the software engineer wishes to change the state of just one feature, controlled by one bit in a register, then the required instructions in software would be a read, a mask, and a write. This can be slow to implement, especially if the system requirements have very low latencies. You don't really want to perform three operations when you could do it in one. So the answer to this dilemma, and to make it just one operation, is the concept of bit banding. This is the system of register aliasing, where each feature is controlled using a full register, rather than a single bit within a register. Once we implement it that way, from the software engineer's perspective, this removes the need to perform a read, mask, write operation, and can be replaced with just a single write operation, because now each register controls access to just one feature, rather than one bit in a register. So what we're essentially talking about here is the concept of aliasing registers, and the address space requirements when you enable bit banding, and thus enable aliasing of registers, are obviously going to be much larger. But this can be deemed as an acceptable compromise, where increased performance is desired in a design. The debug tab is where we can also make a very significant amount of optimizations for the processor core, and thus save a lot of space in the FPGA. There are four basic levels of debug capability that are available here, ranging from no debug features enabled at all, right the way through to having full debug capabilities, including support for the Data Watchpoint and Trace, or DWT. DWT gives software engineers the ability to do performance analysis on the processor core by asking it to count processing cycles and report the numbers afterwards. This can be extremely useful to engineers during development, but it naturally comes with a cost in terms of the logic that's required to implement those features. We've looked at the two extremes there, but if designers want a level of debug capability that sits somewhere between those two extremes, then this can also be selected. It's not just debug features though. Similar options also exist for optimizing the level of trace capability. And, as you can see here, the designer can choose whether they want no trace features, standard trace functionality, which includes the instruction trace macro and debug watchpoint and trace, or full trace, which also includes the embedded trace macro cell. If you're wondering what some of these terms mean, and you're keen to learn more about the features that are being discussed, then you should perhaps consider attending one of our training courses on the ARM Cortex-M architectures, where we explore these topics in greater detail. The depths of ARM processor core configuration are extensive, and I'm afraid that we simply don't have time to go into all of the details during this webinar. Lastly, we can see that we have a simple tick box that allows us to either enable or disable the JTAG interface on the Cortex-M3 core. Let's not confuse the JTAG port on the FPGA with the JTAG port on the Cortex-M3 core. They are different. For the FPGA, the JTAG pins are dedicated pins which you'll find listed in the datasheet. However, for the Cortex-M3 core, the JTAG connections would need to be routed out to standard IOs on the FPGA, and then they would probably be routed to some sort of debug socket on the PCB. You'll note from the symbol that we can see on the left here that the connections will appear and disappear depending on which options that I'm choosing in the GUI. So as you play with these options in the Vivado tools, you will always have a graphical idea of what connections are going to be available as you go along. The third and fourth configuration tabs relate specifically to the tightly coupled memories, or TCMs. These are implemented using block RAM on the FPGA and they allow the designer to include areas of very fast and very low latency memory that sits very close to the processor core. As you can see from the drop-down boxes, the memory sizes that are available range from 8K to 1 meg for the instruction memory, and from 2K to 1 meg for the data memory. Interestingly, this memory can be initialized with data or instructions from the very first moment that the Cortex-M core boots. And this is achieved by making the contents of the memory part of the FPGA configuration bitstream. This is very useful at boot time, because it means that instructions for the processor, and thus the boot code, is available as soon as they are needed, because it's embedded within the FPGA bitstream. So, with the processor core configured the way I want it, we can now proceed with the rest of the design. You'll notice that I switched off most of the options in order to make the rest of this demonstration easier to understand but you can of course make your own decisions to meet the needs of your own system. I'm going to keep things very simple for a moment and show how we can connect up just the processor IP.
Now, obviously, having a processor on its own in a real design wouldn't be very useful, because a processor that doesn't actually talk to anything in the system is arguably not going to be much use. But please humour me for a moment while I demonstrate the way that it can be done. At the top of the screen, you can see that we have a green bar, which is drawing the user's attention to a feature in Vivado that runs something called the Connection Automation Wizard. This can be used to quickly form connections between the various tiles that have been added to the block diagram. Here, we are going to show you how we can run the wizard and save ourselves an awful lot of time by avoiding manual connections. As we go along, you will see that the wizard not only forms connections between existing blocks that are already on the diagram, but it also adds additional required IP from the catalogue where necessary to make everything work. In this case, I'm running the wizard twice, and it will add something called a clocking wizard block and also a reset generator block. As the name suggests, these generate clocks and resets for the design, and the wizard will then connect them up to the external signals where necessary. You've perhaps already noticed that there are two AXI interfaces on the processor core, one for the code memory and one which gives access to other system peripherals. So assuming that the processor core is going to execute code from something externally, we can start by adding some sort of simple quad SPI flash memory controller, and that will give the processor to execute code from an external flash device. The memory controller is added in precisely the same way that we used for adding the Cortex-M3 core itself by dragging and dropping it onto the block diagram from the IP catalogue. Both the Quad SPI controller and the Cortex-M3 core both use the AXI interconnect, and so I'm also going to drag and drop an AXI interconnect tile from the catalogue into my diagram. In the same way that I configured the Cortex-M3 IP, I'm also going to double-click to configure the Quad SPI IP, and then I'm going to choose the options to connect it to an external flash memory, and also enable the Execute in Place feature. Returning to the block diagram, I'm now going to show how the Vivado tools can be used to connect the IPs together. And for the moment, I'm going to manually configure the connections for this IP. And so if I hover my mouse pointer over the code AXI interface on the processor core, you can see that it turns into a pencil symbol. And then I can just click on the interfaces to make the connections between the two blocks on the diagram. The output interface on the Quad SPI controller represents the signals that will be routed across the PCB to the flash component. I can therefore use the Make External feature in the Block Diagram Editor, which is available from the right-click menu. Let's now add two further IPs that are commonly found in embedded processor systems, a timer and a UART light. They are chosen from the catalog in exactly the same way, and I can add another AXI interconnect block to form the connectivity between them. Most UARTs in a processor are software configurable, meaning that you can configure the board rate, parity, number of stop bits, etc. from software using control registers. However, if you think about it, the vast majority of embedded processor designs will have a UART, but the board rate and the other settings are usually set once at the start of the project and are never changed again afterwards. So a UART that has the ability to be configured from software is actually rather wasteful in terms of FPGA resources. And for this reason, Xilinx provide an alternative to the UART called a UART Lite. A UART Lite has all of these settings hard-coded at synthesis time. And the trade-off is that it becomes much smaller in terms of logic resources that are required to implement it inside the chip. It's a simple but clever optimization. And the settings are made here in the block diagram editor using the double click menu in the same way that we did before. You can see that at the same time as setting the board rate, I am going to set the UART to be connected to the USB UART port on the RT development board. It's worth noting at this point that the block diagram editor is board aware. And because I selected the RT board when I created the Vivado project, it knows that there is a USB UART port available on that board. The same is true for the Quad SPI controller peripheral. It's board aware. And so for those of you who are paying attention when I configured it earlier, you will have noticed that I chose the QSPI flash interface from a drop-down list. And therefore it knows to connect the correct signals to the flash component on the board. So we've got a few IPs added to our design. And you've probably noticed at this stage that we now have quite a lot of unconnected clock and reset signals that are stacking up, along with the PCB connections for the UART. I can use the Connection Automation Wizard from the green bar at the top of the screen to connect everything together automatically. And as you can see, very quickly the system is coming together, but with minimal user effort. 
the more attentive among you may have noticed that we don't have any of the interrupts connected yet. The IRQ input connection on the processor core is shown as a 16-bit bus, whereas each interrupt from each peripheral is a single-bit interrupt signal. So I can connect the first IRQ from a peripheral without any trouble, but the design rule checker that's built into the block diagram tool is not going to let me connect a second or third interrupt line to the IRQ input. What we need is something to concatenate the various interrupt signals in the design into a bus, and then this bus can be connected to the IRQ input. In the Vivado IP catalog, this is called the concat block, or concatenation block. There is one last thing that we need to add to this design, and that is to provide a connection to the config ITC MEN signal. Yes, I can hear you're already thinking the what now, but don't worry, we'll discuss it. If we look into the documentation for the Cortex M3 processor, we can see that it has the ability to alias the tightly coupled memory to start either at address 0 hex or at address 10 million hex. And this choice is controlled by setting the most significant bit, bit 1, of CFG ITC MEN to either a 1 or a 0, respectively. It's worth remembering that on an ARM processor, the reset vector, i.e. the first instruction that's fetched at boot time, is always at address 0 hex, and therefore we are essentially controlling whether or not the instruction TCM memory will be mapped to the reset vector of the processor, and therefore whether the processor core will boot from that memory. However, there is a further twist to this control signal. The least significant bit of CFG ITC MEN, bit 0, controls whether the code region of memory at address 0 hex will be mapped to the instruction TCM memory, or, optionally, whether it will be mapped to the quad SPI peripheral. So, in essence, the decision that we're making here is whether we want the processor to boot from an internal RAM or from external flash. It's clever stuff, and we will show you later in these webinars how you can use this configuration to your advantage. For now, we will keep it simple, and we'll configure the design to boot from the internal instruction TCM memory, which is mapped to address 0 hex. For that, we need to provide a value of 0, 1 hex to the CFG ITC MEN signal. And to do this in the block diagram, we can simply add another utility block from the IP catalog, which is called constant. As the name suggests, a constant block simply provides a constant logic value, and the signal on the processor core is two bits wide, as we can see from the diagram. So what we'll do is we'll configure a constant block to have an output of two bits wide, we'll set the value of the output signal to one hex, and we'll connect the constant block to the CFG ITC MEN signal. Now let's take a look at the address editor view for the system that we've created in the Vivado tools. You will see here that there are two address zones shown, and they represent the address space that will be visible to each of the two AXI interfaces that are coming out of the Cortex-M3 processor. We can see from the tools that both interfaces have unmapped slaves, and this is also evident when we look at the blank columns in the address editor. Now, editing the address map of a processor system might seem a bit strange to many of you, especially if you've only ever used discrete off-the-shelf processor chips before. That's because you're probably used to opening the datasheet of a processor or microcontroller that you've chosen and hunting for the chapter in the datasheet that documents the address map for all the various peripherals and memory controllers. Well, let's take a moment to consider that in this case we're targeting an FPGA, and therefore we're really designing the internal architecture of the embedded processor subsystem, not just using the design that somebody else has put in a chip. We've just spent a little bit of time adding peripherals like the UART and the timer, and by that I mean that we really were adding them to the design. In a normal off-the-shelf processor, the peripherals are always there, and therefore the user just decides whether or not they're going to enable them to switch them on. What we are doing here is physically adding those peripherals to our design, so that the gates and nets will be present inside the logic of the FPGA when we generate the bitstream. It therefore stands to reason that we have a lot more control over the design of the system than would normally be possible with an off-the-shelf processor component. And an extension of that idea is that we can also decide on the memory map for the various peripherals by adjusting the value that the address decoders of those peripherals will look for on the address bus. If you're suddenly terrified by the thought that you have to manually configure the address map of a processor, then don't be, because once again there is some automation that can be brought to your rescue here. 
At the top of the address editor, we can see that there's a green button marked Auto Assign Address. By clicking that, we can automatically assign addresses to all of the peripherals that we've added to our processor subsystem, and everything will just work fine. However, if you want to choose your own memory map, then you can, but the tools will also guide you if you make a choice that's not permitted. Choosing your own memory map is an advanced topic, and we may come back to that in a future webinar. And so although this system is quite basic, this block diagram design is now complete, and we could start the process of synthesis, followed by place and route, in order to get a bitstream that can be downloaded to the FPGA on the board. We should, however, recognize that I have not allocated any pin constraints to the clock or reset pins, and so the Vivado tools don't currently know which pins on the chip are designated for the oscillator input or for the reset source. What we have created here is just an example design for demonstration purposes, and I hope you get the idea of how a real production design would be created. So let's now expand on what we have learned. Now that we've got an idea of how you would create your own design inside the FPGA, we will set this design aside and we'll take a look at the reference design that is supplied with the bundle of files that can be downloaded from the ARM website. The reference design is intended for those people who want to get something up and running as fast as possible, and it's been implemented to use the RT board. So let's just take a moment to understand what that is. RT is in fact a family of low-cost development and evaluation boards that have been designed and built by Digilent. The specific board that we're going to use for this reference design is the RT Arctic 7 A35T variant, which, as the name suggests, is using the Xilinx 35T FPGA part from the Arctic 7 range of FPGAs. This particular FPGA has 250 IOs and four high-speed serial transceivers, and it has enough logic in the chip to give us enough space to build some interesting projects. The device has a built-in analog-to-digital converter, and the board is fitted with 256 megabytes of DDR3L memory, which runs at up to 667 megahertz. It has 16 megabytes of Quad SPI flash, and that's what we were targeting earlier when we were assembling our little test design. The board also has 10100 Ethernet for those people that want to implement networking interfaces, and it has a USB UART and various switches, buttons, and LEDs. If you want to add more capability than that, the board can be expanded using the Digilent PMOD style of connectors. And there is also an Arduino R3 style header, which can be used to connect Arduino shields. It is the Arduino shield header that makes this board very interesting for our needs, because we also have the ARM Daplink shield that we will use in this project. Daplink was born from the Embed project, and is an open source software project that helps designers with programming and debugging software applications that are running on ARM Cortex processors. The idea of Daplink is that a second microcontroller is added to the PCB, or in this case, to an Arduino shield, which is connected to the JTAG or single wire debug port of the main processor. A considerable number of development boards now offer a Daplink companion processor, and they run what is known as interface firmware, to create a bridge between your development PC and the ARM processor that you're debugging on the embedded board. So yes, we've now got two microcontrollers on our board, one soft and one hard, but microcontrollers are now so inexpensive that it makes sense to add a simple microcontroller to our design purely to make debugging easier. It also doesn't cost you anything in terms of engineering time to configure that Daplink processor, because the firmware is downloadable from the internet and is simply programmed once at the start of the project. From that point onwards, a simple USB connection is used between the development PC and the Daplink companion processor, and the Daplink firmware, amongst other things, offers a mass storage class of USB functionality, allowing the user to simply drag and drop new software onto the development board from the host PC. Because it's a mass storage class device, the flash on the board appears as a drive inside the host OS. In addition to facilitating the download of new software, the Daplink provides an interface that allows debug and trace features on the Cortex-M processor to be used, so that we can do single-step debugging. And it also gives the user a UART interface to the board. So all we have to do is to connect this Daplink shield to the RT board, and we instantly have a quick and capable debug interface that's ready for use in our development project. So now let's take a look at what's inside the supplied reference design. And we can see that it's pretty much the same as our example test design. There's the Cortex-M3 processor core, a block that generates clocks and resets, 
and there's an AXI interconnect block that provides an interface between the processor and a number of peripherals. In the reference design, there are a few more peripherals than we added to our example design, and that includes a couple of GPIOs that connect to the LEDs, dip switches, and push buttons on the board. There's a block RAM instance that allows the user to access some additional RAM inside the FPGA, but the only big difference here is the DAPLINK block that we can see here in the diagram. The dark blue colour in the diagram denotes that this is a hierarchical block, and if we double-click, we can actually go into that level of hierarchy and see what's inside. We can see that there's a further AXI interconnect, two Quad SPI interfaces, one that's been set up in executing place mode and the other that hasn't. There's a single bit SPI controller, and then there's another GPIO which connects to the control pins of a multiplexer to determine whether it's the Quad SPI or the single bit SPI interface that's actually connected to the memory on the PCB. So, to summarize, if you're feeling a bit confused, the design is actually quite simple and it contains just enough technology to communicate with the DAPLINK shield, to read the push buttons and dip switches, and to drive the LEDs. Just as we did before, we can take a look at the Address Editor tab, and you can see that we have a number of peripherals, all connected to the processor, and with base addresses and high addresses that are mapped into our system. So really, this is no different to what you might see if you read the datasheet for an off-the-shelf processor you would have a table which represented the address map for the processor, exactly as we have here. To save some time, I have already synthesized this design and I've fed it through the place and root tools, so we now have a bitstream that's ready to be downloaded to the board. We can therefore move on to the software side of this project. If you have some experience of traditional processor designs, you're perhaps groaning with dread at this point, because perhaps you have visions of sitting down and writing endless documentation that will be passed on to the software team. That's not an unreasonable fear, because in many projects, that's exactly what you'd be doing at this stage of the design. However, with the Xilinx Vivado tools, things are perhaps a lot more automated than you might imagine. So the next step of the flow is we're going to export this hardware design so as to prepare everything that will be needed for software development. To do this, we can simply go up to the file menu and choose Export, Export Hardware. A special file called an HDF file, which is a hardware description file, is written into the project directory. If your software team was in a different geographical location, at this stage you would simply send this HDF file to them via email, or perhaps by copying it to a shared corporate network drive. To show what happens in a project, we're now going to set the hardware design to one side and we're going to put our software hats on and launch the software development kit. As you can see, the SDK is based on the Eclipse framework and this will be very familiar to many of you who are watching. Our goal in the software development kit is to create a board support package for the Cortex-M3 processor which is a set of drivers and support files that will allow software applications to access the features that are available inside the processor's hardware. From the menu, I can choose the File, New, Board Support Package option. The next screen then allows us to create a board support package that will be tailored for different operating systems. However, on this occasion, we only have one choice available, and that's the standalone operating system. This signifies that there actually won't be any operating system, and that we will be developing bare metal application code. If there were operating systems installed in the SDK, maybe if we downloaded them into this tool from other third-party sources, then they would appear in this list, provided that they were compatible with the Cortex-M3 processor. As you can see, there are none installed for this simple demonstration, and so I will stick with the default choice of standalone and click Finish. The BSP settings then appear on the screen in front of me, and I can choose version 6.7 of the BSP, which just happens to be the version that is currently supported for the Cortex-M3 processors. In the BSP settings, we can then see a number of available options, most of which don't really concern us for this simple test. The only settings that I'm going to choose are for the standard in and standard output devices, and we can see that they are both assigned to the UART Lite. If you've done any desktop software development, you will be familiar with the concept that the standard input device is the keyboard and the standard output device is the screen. In an embedded processor system, these might not actually apply, 
because there may not be a keyboard and screen attached to our embedded processor system. So what the software development tools are doing is giving us the choice of which peripheral to use for standard in and standard out. Well, given that we're likely to be sending and receiving text, the UART seems like a perfectly sensible and obvious choice for an embedded system. In the drivers section of the setup GUI, we can see that there are various peripherals that are all assigned to their appropriate driver. And the processor itself is assigned to something called CPU Cortex M3 driver. And that contains all of the code that controls the internal features of the CPU core. Lastly, in the settings for the Cortex M3 Zero core, we can see that the compiler settings are targeting the correct versions of the GCC compiler and also the archiver. In the field for the extra compiler flags, we can see that the arch parameter is set to ARM v6. Now, if you've done any work with ARM processors, you'd understand that that's exactly what we'd expect for a processor that uses version 6 of the ARM instruction set. So I can now close the BSP setup wizard and we can review what I've created. The first item to note is that the HDF file is present in the hardware platform specification. The SDK has imported all of the details from the embedded processor hardware, and I can review the address map and the version number of everything that's in the system. For some of the peripherals, I can also click the registers link, and I can view the address offsets of the registers for that peripheral. If you've ever used software to control processor peripherals before, then the registers that you'll see here will probably not come as any great surprise to you. The next item in the Project Explorer is the board support package, which has the name Standalone BSP0. It's the one we've just created. The first subcategory is a series of documentation that gives the user all the information they need to use the various drivers that have just been created. You can see that we have documentation for the block RAM, the GPIOs, the SPI peripherals, and the UART Lite. And this, of course, matches exactly the hardware that we added to the system in Vivado. Clicking the links opens the details of each section of that documentation, and each document includes a description of the source files, the API calls, the data structures, and it also gives you some code examples. Finally, we can see that the BSP contains the actual source code files, arranged into a predefined directory structure for each piece of functionality. There are header files, and there are C source code files for each driver. So you can see with absolutely no effort whatsoever, we've actually created a custom BSP that precisely matches the hardware that we designed inside Vivado. So at this point, we have everything that we need. The BSP provides all of the functionality that we need to allow a software application to communicate with the hardware in our design. We haven't had to write a single line of code to develop that BSP. It's all been generated for us automatically. We are now ready to develop our first software application for this board. And that will be a topic for a future webinar.